interview with Leon and Ruth Jacobs from the uh, for the Valley Historical Project, and we're really happy that they would do this for us today on short notice. <laughs> the interviewer is Harriet Blockus, assisted by Ken Blockus uh, with the video camera, and the date is March 12, 1998, and we're at the Jacob home. We want to thank them for granting us this uh, interview. This material will be used to interpret the heritage of our region. It will be primarily used for educational purposes, but may also be used in promoting economic development and tourism. So we'll start out, and I'd like to have uh, Leon, you're the one that's the native from this area all your life. I'd like to have you tell us your full name. Leon Leroy Jacob. Born here in rural Elgin, and what year did you say? in April 13, 1919. Okay. Were your parents born here? My parents were born just about three quarters. My dad was about three quarters of a mile south of where we lived out in the country, and my mother was probably a mile and a half west of where we lived out in the country. Now. How far back do we go to, in order to get uh, relatives that immigrated to the United States? My grandfather immigrated in 1867. 1867. 1867. Jacob. And, and from what country? Switzerland. And my grandparents were born in this country on my mother's side. Well, your grandmother was born in Switzerland. Yeah, I guess that's right. Marina. Milledollar was born in Switzerland, and she married Wesley Miller. Wesley Miller was my grandfather, and they farmed up Bell Creek, about a mile or and a half, two miles up the creek from where we lived. So you, your family is really centered in on a certain area. It is right in that area. Okay, then uh, we'll move to uh, Ruth. And uh, Ruth, you want to give us your maiden name? Ruth Seams, S-I-E-M-S. My dad said it's just like the seam in a coat. <laughs> <It's plural. laughs> and where you were born and when? At Middletown, Iowa. And then October the 27th, 1922. And where were your parents born? My mother was born in Clayton County, Iowa. And my father was born near Danville in uh, Des Moines County. But you had some grandparents that lived in this area. My grandmother, my grandparents farmed in the Elgin area and later in the West Union area and retired and lived in Elgin. My great grandparents lived in Elgin and several of my grandmother's sisters lived in the Elgin area. Oh, you two are really Elginites. And did you have, how far back do we go to find someone who uh, immigrated to the United States? My from? grandfather Royster immigrated from Switzerland to the United States, I think in 1883. And my grandmother was born in Elgin in about 1859. And on my father's side, both of his parents were born in Germany. But they came to the United States with their parents as children. I think my grandmother was 11 and my grandfather was about 4 when they came to the United States. Was this, do you have any idea about when about this was? Or? Uh, 1870, and I think my grandfather Seamus came to the United States. He was born in 1865, and he was about five years old when he came. And my grandmother, I think in 1871, but I'm not sure. Anyway, all your family's been here a long time. Yes, they, they, they came to the Burlington area. Okay. That's where they lived. Uh, Leanne, would you like to tell us your education? Well, I went to, took my grade school education at the Bell Creek number one school, and then I... Where was that located? That was right next door to where we lived, out in section four, or three and four, Pleasant Valley Township. And then I graduated from, Elgin, from the high, from grade school and took my eighth grade exams in Elgin, so I started Elgin High School and graduated from Elgin High School. 
1937. Okay, Ruth? Well, I went to a one-room country school, and it was a good experience. And the teacher didn't want to have each grade, so I skipped a couple. And I started high school in when I was 12, I believe. And high school I, when you were 12? I think that's right. I went to, to Danville High School, and I graduated when I was 16. And I wouldn't recommend it, but that's what happened. And I graduated from, El from Danville High School. It was a high school of about 120 or so students. There were 33 in our class. but And then I went to Burlington Junior College. It was then. Now it would be an area school. I went there for two years. And how many were in your class, Leon? Do you remember? I think there was 27, I believe, if I remember right. So the, the two schools were similar in size. It would have been. Would have been. But your town was bigger. No, no I lived in the country. And right. my town, well, no, Danville is about the same size as Elgin. About 500, 500 to 600 people. Um, would you like to tell about when you were married? Well, we, we we had a church wedding. We were married in Burlington at the Oak Street Baptist Church, and it was not a large wedding by our standards. Although Leon's parents thought it was a big wedding and wondered where all the people came from. <laughs> but by our standard, it was a small wedding. We were married the 16th of March in 1946. And uh, it was spring, so we had forced some forsythia in the house, and we had pussy willows to decorate the church. It was ferns. And ferns. Uh, we did our own decorating. <laughs> we did our own decorating. <laughs> <laughs> and we made our own boutonnieres, but yep. the florist did the fancy work. <laughs> uh, and would you like, uh, Leon, would you like to tell us a little bit about your church? Well, our church was organized in 1879. 79. And uh, give us the name First Baptist Church of Elgin. And it was a, really a branch from Muscatine at the time they came here first. That was Pastors, because the railroads gave them such good transportation. That they came That's back right. and forth from Muscatine, the Iowa. pastor came up every so often to preach and from Muscatine. Really? <laughs> yes. All the way from Muscatine? How often did you have church then? Well, they, they had church more often. They had a local lay preacher. Oh. Afterwards, yeah, yes, but uh, to yeah. start with, why it, it was organized by two brothers. One was organized the Apostolic Church down here, and the other organized the Baptist Church. So you see, <laughs> they're really connected. But the only difference there is very much in beliefs is the preaching that they believe that they've got to be their own lay preachers. And the Baptists are more or less have a man that has gone to school for it. And Ruth, you have a Baptist background also? Right. Originally I was German Baptist. And then, of course, it was changed to English sometime in the 1900s. My grandfather was a Baptist minister. He was a farmer. But he was also a minister uh, of a country church. And then the country church was part of the town church and so on. People had cars and could go back and forth to Burlington to the services. Then they discontinued the country services. Would you like to make any uh, comments on the Baptist church here and about uh, membership, how, how big it is or where it's located? Well, it's 300 Main Street. And uh, what is it? 165 uh, approximate membership. And My mother was a member of the Baptist Church in Elgin, and when she was married, she asked for her a letter of transfer, which was sent to. I suppose it was sent. To the, I think all the Prairie Grove people were members of the Burlington Church. Prairie Grove was the country church, and her letter was sent there, and they said they hoped sometime that uh, a young man from Elgin would come and get one of their young ladies. And so she said that was completed then, when we were married. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you tell us what year the present um, Elgin Baptist Church was built? 
1898. Now, tell me about the residence where you have lived all in your lifetime, Leon. I have lived out on the home farm all my life, except the four years I spent in military service. And now we've been here in Elgin 10 years. So uh, we, I lived out there from the time I was born until um, I was 20, about 22 when I went into service. And, uh, I spent four, just about four years in the service. Is this in the in, Army? In the Army. I was with an anti-aircraft artillery unit most of the time. World War II? World War II. And spent one summer from April till Christmas running winches for the Port Battalion unloading ships, which was a very interesting experience. That was at Anchorage. That was at Anchorage, Alaska. Ooh. So you don't need to take any trips to Alaska. You've been there. We've been there twice since. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but he was also in Hawaii, and he doesn't want to go back there, so I don't get a trip to Hawaii. <laughs> I know how you feel, Ruth, because Ken was stationed in Japan, and he doesn't want to go back to Japan, and that's the number one place I would like to go overseas. <laughs> okay. Um, now, Ruth, you want to tell where you have lived? Well, I was born in uh, in the in rural in the, in the country near Middletown. Middletown was a town then and had its own post office and so on. But and now it's still a town, but it doesn't have a post office. The address is Danville. But the house I lived in was built in 1865, so it was an old house, and uh, I lived there till through school. Then I worked in Burlington for a while at a John Deere dealership where I was a bookkeeper and accountant. I worked there for nearly five years until we were married. I wonder, Leon, if you could tell us when I say childhood memory, something that happened to you that was humorous or frightening or uh, just something that you never have lost. I don't know that I can say anything that was frightening, but the one thing I always still remember is that my younger brother and I, Dad had an old sorrel mare that was blind, and that was our transportation to get places. And we could travel all over with that old horse. We picked up a what was an old corn planter wheels and made a cart out of it and had her hitched to that cart, and we could go in that old... Sorrel mare would depend on us for her eyes, and she would take off, and she'd go just like you didn't know she was blind, but you wanted to be on your toes and not let her run into a ditch. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you say corn planter wheel, were those metal? Yes. They were the old-style solid wheel with a center dip in. and uh, we... now, now, how fast a ride did you get then? Oh, she trotted right along. <laughs> the horse. The wheels, they rolled pretty well? They, oh, oh, they rolled nice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty slow compared to what we do. What we do today, the kids got to have their high-speed cars. <laughs> uh, anything else? Do you remember any? Uh, some of like to talk about Christmas or a holiday or... Uh, well, I don't know about that. We always had our Christmas. We always had our 4th of July when we had... I went to Claremont or some place to get a block of ice and would have ice cream made, and that was usually on the fourth. And okay, come on. You used to have sledding parties. Too. Yeah, we used to have sledding parties on the hills there, and we used to slide when we went to school, and we had some pretty good hills there, and we used to go skating on the creek there, right by the farm, and that was our skating place. You didn't have to go to the skating rink. Didn't have to go to the skating rink, no. But when I, I think we went to skating rink in Claremont when, uh, oh, it was after I was out of high school and they had a tent up there for several summers. That was roller skating. That, that was, was roller, roller skating. skating. We went up there and, and went roller skating. And uh, so uh, 
it was more or less the recreation that we had in the neighborhood. It was, everybody had a sled and in the winter time. We usually had some pretty good parties. <laughs> you live so near the Turkey River. Was there any recreation? What, was there any things you did? Did you go swimming or fishing? I never or? went near the Turkey River. Really? Never went near the Turkey River. Is there we a always, reason? I think the folks were afraid of water, and so was, <laughs> I never learned to swim. And uh, I can quote you one re one thing. Uh, they dosed me in California to teach us how to swim, and a lot of us never did learn it. And when I got into Hawaiian Islands, why the old lieutenant come when he he put me on a detail to to take fellows on a trip around the island or something, and he says, now you don't go in the water here at these places, so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> he so, didn't want to lose his soldier. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, Ruth, do you have some childhood memories? Like you said, you had grandparents here, so that meant even though you didn't live here, you came back here. Yes, we came back to Elgin to visit my grandparents now and then. Uh, not as often as people would visit now, but we came back to Elgin by train a time or two, left by train. That would be my mother and my brother and I. And cars were, it was an all-day trip to come up from southern Iowa. In fact, they tell me I was came up in a car when I was about nine months old, and they stopped at a farmhouse to wa warm the bottle of milk for me. <laughs> but I can remember leaving Elgin in the train. Do you have any idea what a ticket would cost in those days? No, I don't have any idea. I'm sure it wasn't very much. Uh, someone mentioned when they the only train ride they had up to uh, West Union, they had to ride in the caboose. But you did, this was no, this was passenger service. This was passenger service. And we train, changed trains in Cedar Rapids and took me into Urban to Iowa City, I believe. Now you visited a grandparents. Where did they live? They lived on the west edge of Elgin. Um, they had lived on a farm by West Union, but they retired and built a house that was Noah Metzger's on the west edge of Elgin. It was really in the country at that time. And I recall sitting on the front porch there and watching the Elgin baseball team play ball on Sunday afternoon in Shorey's pasture across the road. And did you when you came back here, did you know Leon then? No, not really. I knew his, his sister because I was in her Sunday school class. His sister, Betty, was the Sunday school teacher, but I, I didn't know him. All right. Leon? Yeah. Well, I guess I knew his brother, Al, because he was in the same Sunday school class. <laughs> 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 All right. Would you, uh, Leon, like to tell us a little bit about the job you had all of your lifetime? Well, I, I was started to farm here the last year before I went into the service. I really wasn't, just kind of took over because my dad was sick. And I was the one that was home to take over and I got started farming there. And then that winter, draft notice come up after World War II come along. And Dad went to, went to the draft board and said that that was his farmer. And they told Dad, to, you've got three boys. You just tell one of them they have to go. And Dad says, I can't do that. And so they took me anyhow. How did so, they decide which one? Were you the oldest? No, I was the middle one. So, Maybe they drew names out. I don't know how they decided that. Well, I don't know. Your brother was your younger brother was in school at Luther. Yeah. And younger, your older brother was actually living in Elgin and working at a grocery store at that time. He was married though. Too. He was married. Yeah. And you weren't. And I wasn't. So maybe that's why. That's probably why. All right. And Ruth, you mentioned something about your job. Do you want to tell any more that you worked as a bookkeeper? Well, I worked as a bookkeeper for, at the John Deere dealership in Burlington. And bookkeeper was the name of it. But what I did wasn't exactly always bookkeeping because sometimes I made deliveries for a pickup truck out in the country, particularly fertilizer sacks in the spring. And then we had an old man who worked for us. And he did the loading and unloading. And 
I walked around town paying bills for the company. I did a lot of mailing. Did you ever have a job after you moved to Elgin? Yes and no. I know you had a job <laughs> raising children and helping your husband. <laughs> yeah, there were. Yeah, that was a, that was a big job, and uh, I think every farm wife runs a town for parts, and I think the dealers always make fun of women when they come in and ask for a part for a machine. I sort of caught on to that when I was working in the shop. And I always knew that I knew the serial number and everything of the machine, but they still delighted in heckling me. I think it's born in them. Uh, uh, I did a no number of things. I worked for the canning company for several times, but never, maybe one year I worked the full season. Otherwise, we raised wheat corn. And until our crop was sold and harvested, I didn't work. After that, I worked in the, for the canning company. Um, no one has told us a little bit about the raising of the sweet corn and getting it to the factory. Would you want to tell us a little bit about that, when it would be done, and how it was different from raising other corn? Well, the factory sweet corn was a long ear of corn. I remember one time my uncle was up visiting from Danville, and we had sweet corn. And he said, I've never seen sweet corn in that, that size on ear. Why, well, he said, those, they're a foot long. And they had the little ears that came from the seed corn, uh, seed uh, catalogs. And he wanted some seed of that big corn, and we sent him some. Uh, we raised corn usually on the sandy bottom, so it was one of the first fields planted and one of the first fields harvested. And when the field man said it was time to pick, it was time to pick. First, the... Uh, Did you pick by hand? Uh, not after we were married. I had picked quite a lot, a lot of corn by hand. Picked a lot of it by hand. Sweet corn and or other kinds? Sweet corn and both, both sweet corn and field corn. I picked quite a lot by hand. But I bought a picker the first fall after we were married. I bought a corn picker to pick field, field corn, corn with. Uh, your so mother I, used to tell how she made oilcloth aprons for the kids to wear in, when they picked sweet corn because it was so wet. And the uh, leaves were so wet in the morning to keep them dry, they, she made oilcloth aprons for them. I suppose that was a kind of a cobbler type apron. <laughs> well, we picked, as a neighborhood out there, we picked corn, sweet corn together. And different ones of us did. And still, we did that pretty well up clear to the end of, until they finally started hauling sweet corn with trucks. Before that, when we hauled with wagons, what? Paul Bietikofer and I worked together for quite a number of years hauling. Mm -hmm. We'd haul away from the pickers. And then I guess there was a time there when we was, some of us were picking by hand, and the Krugers had a Alice Chalmers picker, and uh, I believe Geyers had an Alice Chalmers picker that picked for the canning company in different places. But then uh, they didn't do the nice job that the pickers did that the canning factories had afterwards. My job yeah, for corn, uh, picking corn was to feed the pickers. So I know what that was. There was a, always a crew of men hauling and picking and so on. And then the other job was to follow the loads home after dark, either the empty wagon or the loads of cobs that we got for feeding our cattle or for geese. Hogs and geese. Yeah. <laughs> when I say canning factory, what are what's the first thing you think of? Probably long hours. <laughs> <laughs> because I started working when uh, they had one shift. And the shift went on normally about 8 o'clock. All the way in the Husky Shed, we had to be at work probably the quarter to. And we worked until it was pretty well done. Uh, it might be... If it rained, you might be through by 9 o'clock. If it was not, you probably work till 11, maybe till 1. They were long days. They were long days. I, the canning factory was still here when I came to Elgin, and I guess what I remembered was the smell of the flies. <laughs> 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 and also that the cafes were very, very busy. Yes, but we had a, an hour at noon, but a half hour in the evening to eat. So, uh, see, there was a little drive-in down here on the end of the street. And we, once in a while, 
I got to go down there to eat when he was in town. <laughs> Are you talking about Ole? Yes. Was, I think that's Ole it. Olsen? Yeah. Yep. No one's talked about Ole Olsen's uh, cafe or a little drive-in. Could you tell us what it was like? It was very crowded. <laughs> well, very, very small. <laughs> it was very small. It was just a walk-in and, uh, and a counter along and uh, just a narrow spot back of the people sitting there to walk through. And I don't remember eating anything but hamburgers there. I don't know what all they had there. I don't remember anymore. Oh. I remember eating hamburgers there, but it was an hour. I could go home and eat in an hour at noon, but I could not go home in the evening and eat. I had to carry my lunch in the evening. I really liked the canning factory working there. I worked hard enough so I felt I could treat myself to a candy bar, and I did. And didn't some uh, women work there, and it, it would be about the time school started, it would help get the children into school, as we would say, with clothes and Yes, a, a lot of farm women worked there, lots of farm women, and lots of college kids worked there. In fact, several of our kids worked there until school started. Mary Ann did. No, she, she didn't work there very much. She did some, <clears throat> but because she had diabetes, we didn't want her to put in those long hours. So part of the time, she and I split a shift, and she'd work daytime, night, night, or whatever it was. And But Margaret worked packing cans. That's what the high school kids usually did. Up until school started, Robert worked in the with a lift. Well, he worked with uh, empty cans, empty can putting on that. Machine. I don't know what you did when you worked That's there. That's where I worked when I worked there with the empty can machine. I worked in the husking shed, uh, sorting. It was called. I had a fancy name. I can't recall it now. That you sorted out the uh, immature and the wormy years. Oh. I also worked on the huskers. They were geared to husk. 60 years a minute. And I worked upstairs on the cutters, and I worked a little bit downstairs with the canners. Maybe uh, I'm mistaken, but wasn't your dad uh, a field man? My dad was field I man for, quite, coming to our field for quite, a our quite a number of years. Yeah. I can't say how long. I don't remember. But he worked up pretty well until he couldn't do it anymore. Uh, the last year he worked, Robert went with him some of the time, and Ken Schrader went with him some of the time. His grandsons. Would you explain what a field man was? Because my dad did this for the Hampton Corn Factory. A field man checked the corn maturity and sometimes bugs and just the condition of it, of the corn it was in, and to tell. And he would bring samples into the office to check it out, and so they could judge what he was. Telling them, and that that way they decide where they wanted to pick next after they got the pickers. Before that, what well, it was pretty well, the farmers were told you better pick your corn now, <laughs> and they picked it by hand, and everybody was picking and bringing in, and they couldn't control the amount of corn they were getting that way either, and that's why I think they finally went to all their own pickers, and then they could control the amount of corn they were getting. Every I'm glad that you told us this because that's one thing we haven't covered very to this extent. What other things did you raise on your farm or what kind of livestock did you have? Well, actually, we started out, we had mostly dairy dairy cows when I, and hogs, and we had a few beef cattle all the time. And we run, went that way most of the time we farmed until... In 1975 or 6, I think I dropped the dairy cows out because I couldn't, I didn't want to hire a hired man and I couldn't uh, handle it all without it. So I dropped the dairy cows and kept on with beef and hogs. And then the last couple, three years we farmed out there, why well, I had nothing but the beef cattle that let the hogs go too. And we raised a corn, oats, and hay, and diversified our our farm most of the time until we really bought the Semic farm in 1979? No, before that. Yes, it must yeah, have been before about that. About 73 or 4. And uh, Can you tell then, then we pretty well started corn and 
sweet corn and field corn down there. And uh, that's where we grew most of our sweet corn those years until the fa canning factory went broke the one year and we didn't get all our pay. And uh, I started raising some soybeans after that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I think before we started the tape, wasn't it the Semic Farm that has an unusual story of how it was first settled? Well, in looking back through the old records from the farm, we found that 40 acres on the Semic place was issued as a favor to Hugh Wallace of Captain Hubbard's company of Virginia Militia in the War of 1812. So it was a military gift, I guess. But I don't think it, I don't think this man ever lived there. I think it was his widow who got the land. Because that was dated, I think, in the 1850s, 1851 or so. And you also mentioned something about the school land. In looking back at the records of uh, the origins of the farms, the, quite a lot of the land was from the a school grant. I think the date on that was 1850, 1841. Yeah, 1841. It was a land grant by Act of Congress in, in, in 1841. For 500,000 acres of school grant land, and apparently when that was sold, it was given to the to the government, to the state of Iowa, I believe. And when it was sold, the state got so much for schools. Very interesting. Um, I would like to have asked Ruth when I talked to farmers. One thing we haven't talked about was some of the work of the women on the farm, like taking care of the chickens, and I know Ruth loved to garden and raise flowers. Would you like to tell us a little bit about what it was like? Mostly gardening was a necessity because we raised a lot of the vegetables that we ate. Uh, I didn't raise potatoes. Potatoes were in a patch by themselves. And the men usually took care of the potatoes. In but, the cornfield so they could... Uh, well, there were a lot of little patches little around patches the Little patches around the farm <laughs> that we had raised potatoes on. I, d I didn't have them, but uh, tomatoes, we set out probably 100, 120 plants. How big was this garden? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Do you have any idea? Well, probably 100 by 100 square feet. And then, well, and then we had another one across the drive afterwards. But we raised, and we had strawberries, and we had raspberries, and we, to some extent, sold some strawberries and sold some raspberries. And uh, as far as chickens go, we raised young chickens, but uh, and we sold dressed young chickens. We, the children helped. They all had to work. I still say the best thing you can do for a family of kids is teach them how to work. And we had... We raised ducks. We had our own incubator and we hatched our ducks. And one year I can recall dressing 40 ducks between Christmas and Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then we had a baby on the 29th of December. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the full schedule. <laughs> it was. We, uh, we, sold, we had a, a good market for them. We sold them in West Union. A groceryman took them and he labeled them and sold them. Did you sell eggs then or did you just raise chickens to? Too, uh, we sold eggs later on, but uh, not not, this, not to start with. Not Where did on. you sell your eggs? Helen Produce had a route and picked them up. And they came on Thursday. Thursday was the egg check day. Thursday we could go to town and buy groceries again. And that leads me to another question that I don't think anyone's talked about. Did you uh, buy feed in flowered and uh, patterned feed sacks so you could sow Not them. much. I think that was before my chicken feeding before time. time uh, my so. parents did. Mm -hmm. and in fact, I went to college as a freshman in a feed sack dress. <laughs> <laughs> nice white feed sacks that we dyed a rosy pink. I have a quilt that uh, was made out of feed sacks 
and uh, I slept under it, and my daughter slept under it, and when my grandchild comes, she one time we, she rolled up in it. So <laughs> some of those were pretty. Yeah. And my were. mother would try to give my dad instructions to always buy two sacks alike, or well, three. I, I think I remember him trying to pick for a certain color when they were got something from I, the feed store. I don't think you ever did that for me though. No. No, I, don't I think just so. remember my folks doing that. I don't remember. Did you ever trade sacks, you know, like if another lady got the one you wanted? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, now, what about roads? I thought you had something. Well, the roads were dirt roads most of the time back there before, really, yet when I was first a kid. Yeah, but my dad has an article that he wrote out. And your dad? It was Alfred Jacob, and he was born a mile, about three quarters of a mile south of where we lived out on the farm. But he said the first roads were just cow paths. The improvement was the king drag made out of a log split in half, in two, and the flat edge faced forward, which would smooth the ground to some extent when the horses pulled it around. So, I remember some of the old kin drags yet. I remember when Dad used to do some work there in the neighborhood and the, the king drags arose the every so often. I've never horses. heard that expression, king drag. Where do you suppose that came from? I don't know, but that's what I always was heard. That's what I always heard it. And you yep. knew, you yeah. heard that too, Ken? My, my dad talked about the king drag all the time. Yeah. The one we had one there on the farm, didn't we? It was a metal we, one. Right? We had, no, the one we had on the farm we had, uh, had was made out of two by, or three by twelve plank with a steel blade on the bottom, bolted on the bottom. And we had lain, used out there a little when I was growing up. And well, I learned something today, what a king drag is. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. I don't know where the name originated or anything. You suppose they used those when they paid their poll tax by working on the roads? Yes, they used them to put, pay their poll tax. What was poll tax? Every man had a tax that he had to pay. And uh, I know my brother yet, it was yet when my older brother was old enough, and they used to work it out by working the roads in the fall, in the different times during the year. They well, worked was out well that was before they had gasoline tax to to improve the roads. Okay. I think so. I think you could pay it. I as, think you could as, pay it. As money. As was money. it three dollars maybe? I think something like three dollars. And it, otherwise you could work a day or so on the roads. And uh, I know Dad and uh, Lloyd you always worked it with the, with the horses and uh, worked some of the road at certain times of the year. I remember my dad working with a slip scraper for working out his pole tax. Would you like to tell us anything about making hay when you were a child, how you did it? Well, we always had a hay loader. And the one we had had a chain to run around with slats on it. But I worked for a neighbor that had one that worked Long slats run up and back, up and down, and they would uh, push the hay up onto the wagon, and then a man stood up there and leveled it around, and probably had somebody standing on the front end of it that would help load the front end down, or or we had a man driving the horses up there on the front end. It wasn't always a man driving those horses because sometimes <laughs> I drove the horses <laughs> for my dad. I never drove the horses for you for loading hay. But I did for for my dad, and uh, I was awfully glad for the upright on the hay rack because I could prop my feet against that. I didn't fall down in, on the team. I would like to kind of move ahead and talk about your century farm and your pioneer certificate. So we be sure and get it in, and then I have other questions, but I want to be sure that we hear about this. We were talking about it this afternoon. I think we were given the century farm citation in in 1976. Uh, I think that's when it was started. Uh, it was uh, if a farmer, if the farm had been in the family, direct line of the family, 
for a hundred years or more, 40 acres of it, they were entitled to a Century Farm sign. I think we sent the information in through Wallace's farmer at the time, but uh, Farm Bureau worked with it too. And this, uh, we would have had 40 acres of the farm in Lynn's family, his mother's family, since 1863. So we were eligible when it started. That's back almost to the earliest time. It, I think we were at Century Farm about the first year. And then, would you like to tell about the pioneer certificates? So we, we want to be sure. Yeah, this is yours, and this is mine, I guess. I mean, pioneer certificates were issued if you could prove that uh, you had a direct ancestor who had uh, been in Iowa in 1856 or earlier. There was a census, a special census taken in, in uh, 1856. And if you, you'd have to prove that you were a direct ancestor, the proof was you'd name the ancestor and when they were born or when they came to this country or whatever, and then their family and who their family married, and then which one of them was your ancestor, and then that, that person's family. So the, really the state got a lot of family history out of that. It was, it was rather involved. Uh, things, you didn't have to have affidavits and have it proved necessarily, but you uh, had to have supporting evidence, uh, obituaries and marriage certificate copies and that type of thing. Would you read what it says? I don't know what the camera wrote. Well, it's the Pioneer Certificate. The certificate is presented to Ruth M. Jacob, a direct descendant of John and Elizabeth Abbey, who lived in Iowa in 1856 or earlier. And uh, they had come to Elgin from Prairie du Chien in an ox cart in 1855. And, and you're a descendant. What, does you, what name is on yours, Leon? Well, it's Benedict Mag Ma and Magdalene Miller. Which, now, is that the same Millers of Claremont? Well, family? it's uh, same general it's family. Same general family, yes. Leon's mother was a Miller, but there were quite a number of Miller brothers. Now, this farm has been in your uh, ownership for a long time, and you still own it, yes. even though you have been living in town ten years. Right. Uh, what hopes do you have of it staying in the family for more generations? Other than uh, maybe the fa some of the family want to keep it as a investment. That's the only thing I can say. And a place to go home to find their roots. Well, we have a son-in-law. He's a little interested in hunting. He's interested in it from that standpoint. When they come back here, do they go out? Do they ever go out to visit it? Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. You have that. They retain that right. right. The son-in-law wants to come hunting here this fall to deer hunting. He I'm going to come from out of state and get, try to get a license. At least that's their figuring. Okay. Now, when you were young, what were some of the things that you remember that were fun to do? I mean, did you, uh, hunting, traveling, I know you, you have done traveling, but maybe in those days, the traveling was getting on the train and coming back and forth to Elgin. I think I was in Elgin for about the first homecoming. I remember this. Do you have any idea when that was? It was in the 30s, but I don't remember what. Maybe it was in 33? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm hoping we can use these tapes for the next homecoming. My uh, grandmother's sister was Mary Moser, and she lived across the street here on the Main Street where, well, in the house that Art Lance tore down before they built their home. And we sat on her front porch and watched the parade go by because it didn't come up as far as my grandmother's place. And I remember a flatbed truck. I suppose it was an old one going by and there were a couple doing the Virginia reel. And grandma said, you know, I think I'd get up there and do that too. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, being, uh, but were you allowed to go to dance? No, no, uh, because 
dances had a little different connotation then than they do now because it was uh, primarily a public brawl, if you know it. <laughs> and we, we just were not supposed to be involved with that. Uh, were, were, was your family hunters? No, we were not hunters. Never were. I guess, I don't know why. Dad did a little trapping, I think, uh, in when he was younger, but I never did. I did a, tried to uh, once or twice, and I guess I didn't like the smell of it. <laughs> okay. What was it like for you to go to town on Saturday night? Well, uh, all I can remember that we usually went to town. Sometimes we got a haircut in town on Saturday night, and... Uh, Usually, I know if uh, the folks bought groceries at old Adam Boland's store, why there was usually a little candy sack to come home with it. <laughs> that was his drawing card. <laughs> and otherwise, why not too much, I guess, on Saturday night of town that we didn't spend much time in town, just a little to get groceries usually. Do, did your parents ever tell you any stories about the Indians? I'll tell you one story my dad always told. Dad used to, he worked for his aunt and her husband northwest of Claremont. And he used to walk the railroad track to Elgin on sometimes on Sunday to church. And he said that uh, the spot between Bell Creek and Turkey River in there, there's a little flat spot where Olsons had built a cabin in there. That the Indians used to use to camp. Excuse me, that would be like the Turkey River Bridge near the be, valley. Near Valley. Mm -hmm. Being upstream from that, where the Bell Creek comes out into the river, there's a wedge of kind of flat land in there before it jumps up the hill, bumps up into a bluff. That uh, Dad said the Indians used to camp there. That was a camping ground. They come down the river with their boats and would camp there. I used to pester my grandmother. She lived with us in the winter for about 12 years. And I used to pester her about the old times. You know, what did you do in the old times when you were a girl? And she said, do you remember any Indians? You know, I thought maybe she'd get a good scalping story or something. <laughs> but her memory wasn't that wonderful. She remembered the Indi an Indian that came to their, they lived in Elgin, but for a summer or two, they lived in a log cabin toward Brainerd, I think about where the old Earhart place was. And my great-grandfather then operated a sawmill and sawed lumber that he then used in his cabinet making. And uh, when they were out there, she said that an Indian came to the, to the house one time and she was impressed, she was a little girl, she was impressed because he walked so straight and so tall. And he asked for some hay and they gave him the hay and then he left. But she said the neighbors, now the Indians came, some Indians came to their neighbors one time. And uh, the mother was home alone. And she had several small children. And uh, the, 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 there was, uh, just the door opened. I think, think first they knocked and she knew her husband wouldn't knock. He would walk in and the neighbors would probably walk in. But this was different. And then the door slowly opened and in came the Indian. And they wanted food. And she didn't have any food. And so he proceeded to look around, and the kids all crawled under the table and hid in the table, under the tablecloth that was long, I suppose, on the table. And uh, the Indian looked around in the cabin, and he didn't find any food, not much, and he left. So they're not very dramatic. <laughs> Did you have any Indian mounds on your farm? No. no. Not that I know of. They not were, on the farm. Were there the some farm. near you? They claim that they were on this here ridge up, where it runs up back of where the Olson cabins are out there on the creek, up on that rock bluff up along there. Ask Henry Follett about it, and he says there were some there. Those were round uh, ones, weren't they? But they kind of knocked them off when they logged a lot of that country. They rubbed, knocked the mounds down pretty much. And, Fran Klein told about there's a place right across from the um, golf course that was kind of a glen or something? Well, uh, well, well not well, glen. 
Name your Rocky Dale. Rocky, Rocky Dale. Dale, yeah. Okay, and that's where people went for picnics, and sometimes she said the Indians camped there and made baskets. I wouldn't be surprised they did. I found an arrowhead there once. You did? Yes. But I didn't care to go there too often. I wouldn't go alone any place down in there. Well, it's, 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 too a, steep. It's, it's so terrible steep to get in there from without being on the river. You had to have to take a boat in there, and otherwise it's just about straight down. We walked yeah. in there. One of the girls and I walked in there one time when there was no school in the fall. And uh, it was a nice warm day, and the snakes had come out to sun themselves, and I never went back. <laughs> Rattlesnake? I don't think so. Now, uh, do you have any memories of the Depression? Or from hearing from your parents, you were probably quite young. Well, more or less, that uh, nobody had any money at that time, very little money, and uh, if you, we raised everything we could raise to eat, we did. I was in going to high school during that time, and uh, we just didn't didn't have, always. I though I always had a quarter, I think, in my pocket, because they didn't want us. To, being out without anything, if we happen to have to call home or something, but we didn't have any money to spend. I remember when the Burlington Bank closed, and I don't. There were several banks in town. I don't know which one it was. And when the news came to the farm, my mother cried. I think that's the only time I ever saw her cry. And then there was a small uh, bank in Middletown, and uh, I think I had a deposit there. And my dad went up to see about it. And oh, the, 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 the cashier was a neighbor boy. And he said, no, this bank is, is solvent. We aren't going to close. And my dad said, well, just in case, why don't you give me the money that the kids have in here on account? So he did. And I don't remember if I had $16 and my brother had 11 or something like that. It was a lot of money. And uh, my dad went across the street to the grocery store and bought something for my mother. And when he came out, there was a sign in the in the bank that it was closed. Uh, do you have more memories of the drought? Well, in the one summer, I, I can't think. It, maybe it was 36 when it was so bad. My folks went to a church convention over in Wisconsin, and she left. The five of us at home there, and we was told to keep, try to keep the trees and the strawberry bed and the potatoes alive. We hauled water with what was the old steam engine's water tank, and we had to supply the water for a steam engine. We hauled water from three quarters of a mile west of us in the creek. The creek was dry other than way up the far end of the farm, and hauled water with that tank to keep about a load every day to keep strawberries and a hedge around the yard and the yard is halfway alive around there so the garden alive. I guess I remember about the chinch bugs almost more than the than the depression because that was in the 30s when the chinch bugs cleared out the oats crops in southern Iowa and they as I remember it they they between the I don't know whether it was to keep the bugs from getting into the corn or keep the bugs in the oats or from the oats, but there was a, they made a sort of a furrow along and every so often kind of a post hole. And the bugs were supposed to crawl. They wouldn't cross the, there, it was tar that was put in that, tar or some kind of oil. And then they'd fall into the hole. And I can remember my mother going out with a sprinkle can full of oil to renew that strip. And it was terribly hot. I really don't know quite how she did it. How do you think lifestyle has changed from your childhood to present day? About two generations. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean specifically. If you were to tell your grandchildren how the, the biggest change is, what would you say? Your grandchildren don't know what money means anymore. Takes a lot of money to it, buy a little bit. They, but they have too much to spend. They have they, more they don't money know to what spend like. than uh, we ever thought of uh, of spending. And, uh, 
I've said my grandchildren want to make in an hour the wage that I earned in a week. Of course, their wage doesn't buy much. No, uh, I could fill a tank, a, ga a car tank of gas for dollar and twenty cents. We used to. When I even first started driving, we'd whip up to the gas station and say, put in a dollar's worth of gas. <laughs> and, and a dollar twenty-five cents filled it. Well, and we I, went for a drive on that. I remember in, in the early 40s, 40, 41, when we went to, out, we'd drive, we, we had a special station in West Union where we'd get six gallons of gas for a dollar. Oh, we can go get six, you know, take a dollar and get six gallon gas. I don't think it ever fills the tank, but. That is a big change. Can you think of anything else that you can just see a, a tremendous change? Cars are more comfortable to ride in. <laughs> um, I don't remember. What exactly. about community? Excuse me. What? I don't exactly remember how it worked, but I had a Model A Ford. And it somehow or other had a suction windshield wiper. I don't know just how it worked, but uh, it, it, it took the water off, and it had some kind of a heater, but when I went back and forth to work, I had a blanket over my feet. It was too cold. And we know communication has really changed. I would like to am, challenge you for a minute to think about this. Uh, if you were doing a, we've been seeing a lot of tourism ads on television from different states. And if you were going to give a little talk about why people should come to Northeast Iowa, especially Elgin, Claremont, Wadena area, what would you tell them the reasons that they should come? The beautiful colors in the fall of the year, for one thing. And it's you know, the rest of the year, it's usually always green. Yes. Yeah. What about... It's I would, I would think the snow, being we have trees, and then we get, it holds the snow. Yeah, it. It's beautiful right now. We get the, the snow, with all the snow we have. And, the change of the seasons are something to be appreciated. We, uh, maybe we don't care too much about some of them, but with the change of the seasons make, it, make life interesting. What would be some of the things they should see or some of the activities they should participate in? We had a family reunion here a number of years ago, and it was interesting. They thought what they, they the young folks planned what they wanted to do, the cousins, and they, uh, they had a, a short family concert at the Sunday school in, in Claremont where uh, our nephew played the organ. And I believe a niece played the organ. And uh, of course, they had to try how the bellows worked, how, how it had to be pumped. They were glad it was electrified. And um, they wanted to go canoeing. So they had canoes that came from Claremont down to Elgin. They like to go for walks when they come. Those things seem to appeal to. Young people. And if they were hunters, what would they? What would you say? I don't come from a hunting family, <laughs> although I think they did more than Leah's family did. There's lots of deer and there's lots of turkeys in the area. That's one thing. But whether <laughs> some people say they're a nuisance and some people say they're all right uh, for good for hunting. So <laughs> okay, there's been a tremendous change in the deer uh, from when I first moved to this area. Oh, I don't think there were any deer around here when we grew up where they can. No, uh -uh. Yeah. until in the 40s sometimes. Yeah, I think it was after we was home from the service that to uh, start to finally see, start to see a deer once in a while. And turkeys, that's been now within the last 25 years or so. I guess we always like to go for a walk in the woods in the, summer, in the spring. I usually one or two of the kids that go along. Look for the wildflowers. We go for a walk in the woods, but if we happen to find mushrooms, then we went on a mushroom hunt. <laughs> and we have found turkey nests. We, yes, we found a couple wild turkey nests twice by walking in the woods in the spring of the year. And One time there were thirteen eggs. Another another nest I think had fifteen. Yeah. We really have appreciated hearing you. You are both 
good storytellers, but more than that, I can tell that you are historians. <laughs> you really know the history of this area, and I learned a lot of things today, and I want to thank you. Do you have anything else? Are we? Well, my dad came to Elgin in, I think, about 1910, and that's when the electric lights came to Elgin. And uh, actually, he lived right next door here for a while with Hans Graders. But after he was married, he lived second house down from the Quap on Main Street. After they were married for, what was it, one year? Or two, or something like that. And they started farming. Uh, do you want to read what he said there about the... Uh, Elgin, the first electric lights came to town, and what a sight. Before that, there was no lights, just oil, and no telephone or convenience of any kind. And the roads were cow paths. I think we are just about out of time. I hate to start another topic in case we get cut off. That's fine. Thank you so much. It was fun.